It's a blessing to be a part of a loving and growing family here at the Lehman Avenue Church of Christ. We are grateful for the presence of everyone, but especially this morning for those who've recently obeyed the gospel, put on our Lord in baptism, not only become Christians, but become a part of the family here at Lehman Avenue. And so I'm going to ask those who've recently been baptized to stand. We've got CJ and Walter Moore, their mom, Shannon Anthony, and also Alicia Harris. These were recently baptized into Christ. Some of you were here for those. And Amen. also place in membership with us this morning are two families. There is Wanda and Denver Young, and also Cody and Summer Basham, and their two children, Sadie and Charlie Ann, and if they could Amen. stand up as well. So the Bible says that God adds to the church and places people in it, and also that church membership is a biblical thing as we become a part of a local body. One of God's favorite ways to describe his people is in familial terms. The church is called the household of God. Ephesians 2.19 and Galatians 6 and verse 16. We're God's people. We're his temple. But we're also God's family. And a part of being a part of God's family is that there are joyous and happy occasions. There are times when we rejoice together. And then there are times when we have to engage in things or deal with things that may not be as pleasant. It's kind of like a child receiving medicine or a painful surgery or getting a shot of some sort, something that has to be done in order to preserve the life but is also not pleasant for those who are engaging in it. Many a parent has seen the face that you see on the screen as they attempted to administer medicine to a child that was going to be good for their health but ultimately bad for their taste. And so it is spiritually in the body of Christ. There are great and joyous occasions. And at the very same time, there are sometimes difficult occasions when, as God's family, there are hard things that we have to engage in in order to restore an individual's life and ultimately to save a soul. When Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 18, throughout all of the Gospels, Jesus only uses the word church two times. In Matthew 16 and verse 18, Jesus uses the word to talk about the fact that he is going to build his church. But then in Matthew 18 and verse 17, he uses the word church for the second and only time to talk about when church discipline has to be practiced in what he calls their call together the church. And so we should take pause to appreciate the two times Jesus uses the word church. One is in a positive, I will build my church. But the other is in a more challenging way and when he talks about the church collectively coming together to discipline one of his members. Sometimes we throw this word around, church discipline, and various people in religious circles have ideas about what it means. Sometimes people view it as kicking somebody out of the church or excommunication, and none of those ideas are what the Bible actually teaches. A working definition of church discipline, as far as I can see in Scripture, would be this. Church discipline is a loving process of correcting sin in the life of the congregation and or its members with the goal of preserving the purity of the church and ultimately restoring and saving the soul of the sinner. Church discipline is the loving process of correcting sin in the life of the congregation and or its members with the goal of preserving the unity of the church and ultimately restoring the soul and saving the sinner. And so while not pleasant, it's one of those things that has to be done. And if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn it to Matthew chapter 18. All of us would like to say we will always live in such a way that this would never have to be practiced. And that's really what God desires. But if the occasion ever comes about, Jesus haven't, hasn't left it up to us to merely be nonchalant and say, well, there's nothing we can do or need to do. Neither, on the other hand, has he left it up to our own choices to say this is how we'll deal with infractions. But instead, in Matthew 18, 15 through 20, Jesus gives a step-by-step -step outline for how church discipline is to be practiced in the family of God. And if Jesus is the Lord of our lives and the Lord of the church and we're in his family, then it's Jesus' house rules. And on occasions, and when the time comes or if it comes that an individual in the family needs to be disciplined, Jesus says, here's how you do it. And so briefly, we just want to note four things about our responsibility as members of God's family in times when church discipline has to be practiced. And then Neil will come up and speak to us about why such needs to be practiced according to what we find in the New Testament. Here's the first thing Jesus tells us. Number one, responsibilities in church discipline. There is the personal correction. Matthew 18 and verse 15 says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he hears you, you've gained your brother. There is this idea of personal correction, one-on-one. -on -one. That is, the person who's been sinned against, been made aware of an infraction, he's to go to his brother one-on-one -on -one and tell him his fault between those two individuals alone. And if he hears you, you've gained your brother. It makes perfect sense, and you can see this in verse 15, why this would be the first step Jesus says, personal one-on-one. -on -one. In the first place, the may not know that he or she has done 
long. And in this one-on-one interaction, it'll be brought to their attention. But in the second place, it is to say, let's not make things any more proportionately dramatic than they need to be. If it's just between these two parties, then perhaps the opportunity can come in this one-on-one interaction to solve the problem. But of course, thirdly, the whole purpose of this, and it's at the end of verse 15, is that a brother may be gained back if such is needed. James says in James 5, 19 and 20, Brothers, if any of you does wander away from the truth and one bring him back, let him know that he that brings back a sinner from his wandering way will save a soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The first step in church responsibility as it relates to church discipline is individual correction. Notice this isn't optional. This is an imperative. That means if you're in the body of Christ, if you're a part of God's family, if you're a Christian, a member of the family here at Lehman Avenue, and a brother or sister falls into transgression, according to Jesus, we don't wait for them to come to us. We go to them. It's what Paul says in Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Brothers, if any of you is overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. You go with the purpose and effort of restoring and bringing this individual back. You go one-on-one. A.T. Robertson says on this passage that this is a challenging and courageous thing to do, but it is the way of Christ because, after all, he commanded it. Blomberg says how impressive it is that personal interaction when individual sins is often the last line of defense instead of the first when that's exactly what Jesus commands us to do. When as it relates to church discipline, personal correction means we go as individuals. It can be uncomfortable, but it's exactly what Nathan did to David in 2 Samuel 12 and verse 7. He said, you are the man. It's what Paul did to Peter in Galatians 2, 11 through 14, when he says, I withstood him to the face because he stood condemned. It's what Jesus told his followers to do in Luke 17, 3 and 4. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he comes to you seven times in a day saying, I repent, you forgive him every single time. But first, there must be the one-on-one interaction. And that's exactly what Jesus wants. Notice the rest of the verse. He says, and if he hears you, you've gained your brother. That is, that church discipline can start and end with this first personal correction if an individual listens and if they hear you. Proverbs 25 and verse 9, argue your case with your neighbor secretly and don't reveal secrets. If this individual hears, if they heed, if they listen, then the problem is solved. And he says, I want you to be an individual that argues and strives for reconciliation. Because remember, church discipline is not about embarrassment. It's about embracing. It's about reconciliation. It's about forgiveness. It's Jacob and Esau in Genesis 33 and verse 4 as they collide into each other's arms and embrace one another as the issue between them has been resolved. And that's exactly what Jesus wants in his family. When there's sin, the first line of defense for the church as it relates to discipline is personal correction. But then, secondly, Jesus says there's a second step, the purpose and the role of the witnesses. Look at verse 16. He says, but if he refuses to hear you, take one or two others along with you that at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. If a brother falls into sin and I know about it, if a person transgresses against me, Jesus says, you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That is, brother A is supposed to go to brother B and try to resolve it. Now, sometimes we forget our ABCs. Brother A sins against Brother B, and Brother A goes and tells brothers X, Y, and Z. Jesus says, don't do that. You take it to you and him alone. But if he won't hear you, you don't have Jesus' permission to give up. Not yet. He says in verse 16, you take one or two others that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. This idea of every word being established in the mouth of two or three witnesses goes back to the Old Testament and passages where Old Testament Israel was called upon to discipline their own and punishment could not be meted out unless there were at least two or three witnesses that verified that's exactly what happened. And so Deuteronomy 19 and verse 15, there's this idea of punishment has to take place in Israel. Make sure that you gather together two or three witnesses so that we can verify the charges. Deuteronomy 17, 1 through 4, he says, if somebody practices idolatry before you execute him for his crime, make sure that you gather together two to three witnesses. More than that, on occasion, the two or three witnesses would be called upon to be the first ones to stretch out their hands in punishment, verifying they saw exactly what they claimed to see. And so Jesus says, as it relates to church discipline, you go to an individual one on one. But if he won't hear you, you take one or two. You don't take your crew. You don't take your posse. You take people that are spiritual in nature, that are striving to hopefully restore this individual and uphold the health of the relationship. That's what Jesus wants us to do. And I know you can appreciate why there would be two or three witnesses and why they would need to go. The purpose of the two or three witnesses is, is at least twofold as far as I can see. Number one is to make sure that there really is an issue. 
that Brother A is not having some sort of spiritual hallucination and seeing a problem where there isn't one. These one or two that go along with him will verify that that really is the case. Proverbs 18 and verse 17 says, He that answers a matter before he hears it is folly and shame to him. It says that if you answer a matter before you hear it, or the first person in his call seems just, but his neighbor comes and searches him out, Proverbs 18 and verse 13, the two or three witnesses are to go along to see, is this person actually in sin? Have they agreed that they're in sin? Or are they saying there's nothing so far as they can tell that they've done wrong that necessitates a need for godly sorrow or repentance? But the second thing is this, if they are in fact in transgression, the two or three witnesses are to come alongside the first and say, we want you to come back. Jesus believes that the two or three that gather together on his behalf and try to confront the person that's in transgression and sin will have perhaps greater success than the first person that went by himself. Two are better than one because they have a great reward for their labor, Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 12. And so Jesus says, you take two or three witnesses with you. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Turn your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and notice what Paul says in verse 19 about the same idea in this relation of two or three witnesses as it relates to even accusations against elders. 1 Timothy 5, 19, Paul says, don't receive an accusation against an elder unless it's by two or three witnesses. And this idea is this, make sure you actually have an infraction. And if you do, you're to plead with this individual to hopefully try to bring them back. The two or three witnesses go so that in the mouth of two or three witness, mouths of two or three witnesses, every word may stand firm and be established. It's the effort to try to win an individual back. The first line of defense is personal correction, but if the offender, if the sinner won't receive that, he says, you take along these others that perhaps he or she will listen to them and you can win them back to the Lord. Sometimes in your house, somebody's trying to open a jar or some container of sort and they just can't get it open. And somebody else is walking by and probably thinking, look at this weakling, they can't get the job done and they jump in to help. And what happens on that occasion is perhaps this other family member can get it open. And what that means is probably the other person loosened it up for them or maybe they were stronger, or maybe they were turning the wrong way altogether. But if the second person comes along and they can't loosen it, and then other family members come along and they're unable to loosen it, and friends come over and they're unable to loosen it, then you know what that means. It means the struggle was and is justified. It really is hard to crack. It really can't be opened easily. And it justifies this idea that this is, in fact, a hard case. And so it is with the heart of an offender and a sinner. The first person goes, and when they're not heard, when you bring two or three witnesses, if they won't listen to those individuals, Jesus is hoping that perhaps the two or three come along and they can crack open the heart, that the ears will listen, that the wheel will be turned. As Peter says in Acts 8 and verse 22 to Simon, repent and pray that perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven. So far as God is concerned, when you bring along the one or two, and now there's the two and three collectively, it just might be the thing that can open up an individual's heart that was hardened and stubborn against his will. And maybe the pride will fall and an individual can turn and be restored. Jesus says you start with personal correction and then there's the witnesses and they have a purpose. And then thirdly, there's participation from the entire church in verse 17. Jesus says you go one on one. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if not, you take one or two that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And then thirdly, in verse 17, but if he won't hear them, you tell it to the church. And if he won't hear the church, then you let him be to you as a Gentile or as a tax collector. In verse 17, he says, after you've taken your witnesses with you, if you won't hear them, you're supposed to gather the entire congregation together because after all, we are a family. And bring this person before the family of God in efforts to try to win them back. If it couldn't be done with the one or the two or the three, Jesus says, surely the people of God will jump in and they will help and be an aid to hopefully restore this individual. The Greek historian Herodotus says that there is strength in numbers. And Jesus backs this up by saying, this is exactly what I want you to do when one of our own falls into sin, impenitent sin, high-handed sin that a person won't repent of. Listen, step number three in the process of church discipline, as Jesus lays it out in Matthew 18, is not about the church being in the know. This isn't about us just learning about individuals' dirt. It's actually about rolling up our sleeves to help a wayward Christian come back to what he or she knows. It's Revelation 2 and verse 5, repent and be restored to your first love. Neither is Jesus merely checking boxes so that he can get to the last part of this. He really believes that this will work, and those of us who are in the family of God must believe the very same thing. That if we do, when the occasion calls for what Jesus tells us in Matthew 18 and verse 17, that we can collectively restore and bring back those who have strayed. He says, I want you to go and tell it to the church. Jesus says that because he believes in you and he believes in me. That's right. Jesus believes that when the time calls for it, his people will respond as the spiritual first responders that we are.
Jesus is saying, if you see a brother or sister in this shape and it gets to this point, this is not a person to be mocked. It's not a person to be made fun of. This individual needs our prayers, our calls. They need to be written to. They need to be visited. Jesus says, all hands on deck. It takes the entire church, if it ever gets to this point. Encourage one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, Hebrews 3.13. Encourage the faint-hearted and di discipline the weak, 1 Thessalonians 5.14. Jesus says, I want you to do this, and I believe you can. And it's the responsibility of every member in the family of God. Tell it to the church. Now look at your Bible in verse 17 and notice the first part of this phrase. This does not suggest on this occasion that all has been done and a person is completely ousted from the church. We're not at that point yet. Jesus says, tell it to the church with the hopes that an individual can be brought back. But he says, if he won't hear the church... Then you let him be to you as a tax collector or as a Gentile. Jesus says when you've exhausted all other measures, if a brother or sister just won't heed, if they won't turn back, he says on that occasion, you let them be to you as a Gentile or as a tax collector. Jesus is saying if a person loves their sin that much and you've gone as an individual and then two or three of you, three of you have gone and then the entire church comes together, he says I want you to treat them just like you would an unbeliever. Now, throughout the gospel, we see Jesus loving and being kind and compassionate towards tax collectors and sinners. He's not asking for us to mistreat our brothers. Even those that have been withdrawn from, according to 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15, are still to be admonished as brethren. But this final step that Jesus gives us does need to come into action if the case calls for it. Jesus is saying, you withdraw your fellowship from this individual who is no longer walking in the light. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6. After the first and second admonition, some individuals have to be rejected, Titus 3, 9 and 10. And if it ever comes to that and one among us says, I'm going to live the way I want and turn away from the Lord, if they ever sneak back into our midst and hear us and eavesdrop and hear us speaking of them, they should always hear us talking about them behind their back to their father in his face. That's right. As we're praying on their behalf for their restoration and for them to come home. In verse 17, Jesus says, you tell it to the church. This matters. Because verse 17 says, if you're in God's family, these are his house rules. It won't do for an occasion for church discipline to come up and somebody says, well, that's what they say, but not me. Hey, listen, I don't think it was that bad anyway. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Hey, everybody's got sin. Everybody falls short. I'm no better than anybody else. I won't. They can withdraw from them, but not me. Not if you're in the family. That's right. Nobody can say, well, that's my family member. That's my friend. I'm going to stick with them. Jesus says, if it ever comes down to choosing to do what I say versus what you think, Jesus says, I always want you to submit to me. If you're in my family, we're the family of God. He says, you do everything you can to make sure it doesn't come to that. But if it does and you belong to me, you tell it to the church. And then once the church does everything she can do, you treat that individual just like Jesus says, not out of hatred, but ultimately out of love. And here's the fourth thing before Neil comes up and talks about why we do this. Church discipline is ultimately about pleasing God in heaven. In verse 18, Jesus says, I want you to remember, whatever you bind on earth would have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth would have already been loosed in heaven. If two of you agree on earth is touching anything, whatever you ask, it will be done for you by my Father, which is in heaven. He says, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Jesus is saying to you and to me, he's saying, when you do this out of love, he says, I'm right there with you. Whatever you bind on earth would have already been bound in heaven. That is, God has already pronounced his judgment on what to do in these occasions. And he says, I simply want you to follow suit. This matters because sometimes people have a Jesus of their own making. Listen, the Jesus of the Bible will save you. The Jesus of your own making cannot. Amen. It won't do to say about this subject, Jesus wouldn't do anything like that. I know my Jesus would never treat anybody like that or do anything like that. That's the Jesus of your own making. The Jesus of the Bible not only approves of church discipline, According to this passage, he's the one who instituted it. And we are on his side when in love and in compassion and kindness and grace toward the impenitent, we do exactly what Jesus tells us to do. And so in verse 19, he says, if two or three of you gather together concerning anything on earth and you pray to me, he says, I'll hear you. And finally, in verse 20, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. This is not a verse about family worship in the camper privately by ourselves. Verse 20 is about when two or three of you gather together and you've done everything you could to restore the wayward individual and they won't turn back. He says, when you pronounce judgment and practice that last step of church discipline, he says, I stand right alongside you. Maybe you've heard this phrase before. We all have to be on the same what? Page. On the same page. There's discussion about where that originates. Some people say it originates in choral groups. 
where individuals that are learning the song have to be on the same page. Some people say it goes back to the ancient world with tutors teaching in various Greek societies and everybody needs to be on the very same page. No matter where it originates, Jesus is saying at the end of this passage in Matthew 18, as it relates to this subject matter, you and I have to be on the very same page. Jesus says, if somebody ever walks away from me, I want you to do everything you can to bring them back. But if they keep walking, he says, I want you to love me more. He says, if they turn away and they won't turn back, I want you to stand with me and do everything you can to restore them. But don't ever let go of my hand so that you can hold on to theirs. What is church discipline? It's a loving process of correcting sin in the life of a congregation and or its members with the goal of preserving the purity of the church and ultimately restoring and saving the soul of the sinner. Jesus says, you go one on one and try to solve the problem. Then you take one or two that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may stand firm. If they won't hear that, you tell it to the church and collectively their strength in numbers. You do everything you can to win them back. But if they turn a deaf ear to all of those people that love them, if they turn away from me, Jesus says, it's in that moment that you let them walk away so that you can continue to hold on to me. You never quit on them. But Jesus says, I want you to love me more. But why do we need to practice church discipline? That's what Neil's going to come and preach to us about. I think if there is a word that we struggle and that we use most often when it comes to the revealed will of God, it has to be the word why. You think about how often the Bible presents for us that question why. Why should this be done? Why does it matter? I think it's the question that is asked by the sufferer. The sufferer who is facing some kind of affliction despite trying to do the very best that they can how often are they like the psalmist who in Psalm chapter 10 and verse 1 says, Why are you far away from me, O Lord? Why are you silent in the day of my trouble? But it's not just the sufferer that asks this question. Sometimes it's the struggler, either struggling physically or emotionally or spiritually. It may be the one who sees their own desires come into conflict with what God is telling them to do. You think about those Israelites that come out of Egypt and in Numbers chapter 20 and verse 5 they say to Moses and Aaron and the leadership, why have you led us out of Egypt into this detestable place? Maybe it's implied by Naaman. Naaman who is told to dip seven times in the Jordan River in 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 12. He rebuffs this counsel, this uh, command that's given to him. And it's a question of why. And I think so often it's the case that a sinner will ask the question why when their own desires come up against the revealed will of God. There are three accounts of the rich young ruler and while the question why is not overtly asked, is it not seen as it were in the body language that he gives and going away sorrowfully when God says through Christ to sell all that you have and give to the poor. But I don't know that there is a place or a time where the question why may be more often asked than when it comes to a circumstance where it may be that church discipline has to be practiced. The question is why. I don't think there is any doubt but that Jesus, as he is preparing his disciples, in Matthew chapter 18 in the text that Hiram has just shared with us, is preparing the way for what's going to happen in the church after its establishment. But you remember as he's getting ready to go to the cross that he sits down his disciples, his apostles, and he tells them that he is going to bring to their remembrance the things that he has said to them, and he is going to guide them into all truth, John 14, 26 and John 16, 13. Peter, uh, rather, uh, Paul tells us in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 through 22, that you have apostles and prophets, and the will of God is built upon the chief cornerstone of Jesus Christ. And Paul himself says that the things that he is sharing in his inspired letters are from the direct revelation of Christ. And so we see a situation in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 where Paul, moved by the Holy Spirit, is writing about a circumstance that has arisen. I invite you, if you will, to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm going to do something that I don't always do. As we look through this chapter, I'm going to read alongside of you. So if you'll read, to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 
We're going to be looking at that in just a moment. I want you to see here that though there were a lot of problems that were going on in Corinth, none were more serious and severe than what the Apostle Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. He says it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and that which is not even mentioned among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. When we think about the church discipline that has already been described for us, we need to understand that this is not the impulsive idea of a frustrated people. It is the intentional plan of an omniscient God of love. And while the term church discipline is not to be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the idea is very clearly present. You'll see it in various phrases and words that are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, Deliver such a one unto Satan. And then he's going to uh, say about that, Do not associate with them. He will use the word purge, and then he will use the word remove. The Apostle Paul is trying to unite the church at Corinth to deal with a matter of such gravity that they are concerned about the outcome of this individual. What I want us to see is that our loving God does not simply give us an answer to the question, why is this to be done? If I have it right, there are at least five reasons that he gives that have to deal with us with one another, that have to deal with us and God, and that at the heart of it all has to do with the individual who is under consideration. So let's look at these. If you have your Bible... Our first reason is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 2. And that is to keep a proper perspective of sin. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 2, Paul says, And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. What we need to see is at the very beginning of this that to get to the heart of the problem, they needed to see that there was a heart problem in the congregation. In this particular situation that's being unfolded for us, the entire congregation by this point knew about this man who had his father's wife. And instead of mourning, instead of this breaking their heart, instead they were arrogant, perhaps even proud about the situation that existed. And so God gets to the heart of the matter by trying to get their hearts to change. I realize that we live in a world, in a society, where terms are being redefined constantly. And one thing that happens when this occurs is that things that the Bible calls sin are relabeled and said not to be a big deal or to not even to be sin. Church discipline is about us aligning our view of sin with God's view of sin. And when we see what God did in order to take care of sin, we realize how great a matter it is, how grave it is that He sent His Son for sin. But when we see how God looks at sin, we see such things as Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2, that our sin separates us from God. We look at Romans 6 and verse 23, where we see that the wages of sin is death. And we go back to 1 John 2 and verse 2, and we see that sin caused Jesus to die on the cross. And so what Paul is trying to help this Corinthian congregation to do is to align how they look at this sin with how God does. But I want you to notice that there is a second reason that is given for us as to why this is to be done. We read about this in verse 4 and verse 5. He says, When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present, with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. The second reason why church discipline is to be practiced is to preserve a soul at the day of the Lord. He's talking about the judgment. I want you to notice that there is a connection that is tied to what we just saw in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 through 20. If you want another reason to see why that passage is not talking about a couple of people getting together and worshiping, but that it is an outgrowth of the church discipline process, that what is done on earth is that which is confirming what has been done in heaven. You'll notice what the Apostle Paul says 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 4, he says, When you are gathered together in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is with you in the power of the Lord Jesus, what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 18 is church discipline. And what Paul is talking about here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is the same exact subject. But notice the why. Why this is being done is to cause this individual who was caught up in this lifestyle of sin to see that it's wrong and for them in seeing it be wrong to sorrow and in their sorrow to repent. It is the idea from God that this is to be done so that we do not ignore a situation or that we do not treat it as no big deal. Now, sometimes the rationale is given by a parent that they will not practice something like spanking because of the same kind of a rationale. They say, how loving is it to do something like that? And of course, if it is not done in the right way, if it is an impulsive action of a parent in sinful anger that is done without restraint and without self-control, then it is wrong. But when it is done in a proper mindset, when it is done by a loving parent, in regards to a circumstance that you're trying to keep that individual from harming themselves or harming others, then it is that which might alter the course of the future. What the Apostle Paul is saying here, that as you practice this, the second reason why is, even though there may be an unpleasant short term, what the ultimate desire is, that on the day in which our Lord returns, that that individual may be saved. If I can give you a spoiler alert, it seems to me that in the case of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when this action is taken, it appears to me in the early part of the second letter that this same brother against whom this action is taken, he does feel sorrow and he does repent. And the church has responded in the way that we were encouraged a moment ago to such a degree that Paul says, listen, show more compassion, show more love, and that is important as well. But the bottom line of this is that this is to be done in order that their soul may be saved in the day of the Lord. But then the Apostle Paul gives us a third reason. It's found in verse 6 through 8, and that is to purge the leaven. And the Apostle Paul is to present, or prevent rather leavening. If you look in chapter 5, beginning at verse 6, still talking about this, he says, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The Apostle Paul is appealing to a circumstance that is found in the natural world, and that is the leavening process of yeast. You know, Jesus taught this in a positive sense. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 33, he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a woman who took a, a small amount of yeast and put it into several measures of wheat. And in mixing it, the entire batch was positively affected. You see, there is a change of leavening. And the leaven that's described here, Paul calls as the leaven of malice and evil. What Paul has warned in the church there is that if there is a circumstance, that, and we'll look at some of the examples that he gives in addition to verse 1 in verse 9 through 11 in just a moment. But he says if we don't take the attitude that this must be dealt with, it does not change the facts of the situation. What it means is, is that we hurt our influence in the community for Christ and we hurt our relationship with God. And so because we want to do what it is that our Lord says to do in order to maintain our relationship with Him, in a situation like this, we want to check the epidemic spread of sin. What happens if willful sin, a lifestyle of sin, is acknowledged by those in the body of Christ and nothing is done about that? Perhaps it sends the message that it's really not a big deal. Or perhaps it sends the message that if you do walk contrary to the will of God and engross yourself in a, in a sin of such a level that you have severed your relationship with God, that the church is not going to do anything about it. The Apostle Paul says to prevent the epidemic of sin, you practice church discipline. 
The fourth reason is given for us in verse 9 through verse 11 where the Apostle Paul is going to talk about those who are under consideration. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters since then, you would need to go out of the world. But I am now writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. The fourth reason that the Apostle Paul gives in regards to this subject is to purify associations. Paul says that when someone is caught up in a situation like this, listen, in case we're not saying this plainly, we're talking about not the presence of sin, but willful sin and a lifestyle of sin. The Apostle Paul says there is an obligation that we have to purify our association, that we are to acknowledge that this has taken place and that we cannot hold hands and embrace someone who has let go of the hand of God in embracing sin. You'll notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and verse 10 that the Apostle Paul is going to be talking about some of these same type of situations when he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators or idolaters or adulterers or effeminate or abusers of themselves of mankind or drunkards or uh, revilers or extortioners or swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. And so the Apostle Paul is saying that we cannot extend fellowship to those who are not in fellowship with God. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, This then is the message that we have heard of Him, and declare we unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If anyone says he has fellowship with God and walks in darkness, he does not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sins. 2 John 9 through 11 is talking about perhaps a teaching or a doctrinal situation. But he says, Whoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ does not have fellowship with God. And he says, You cannot extend fellowship to one who has let go of that fellowship. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14 through 17, you have a similar principle that we are not to have communion and fellowship, not even to sit down and to have a common meal with one who might think through that association that we endorse what they're doing. And then the Apostle Paul gives a fifth reason. And perhaps we recoil at the very thought of this, and that is to practice judgment. And we see this at the end of the chapter in verse 12 and 13. He says, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Paul is saying that those who are not inside of the body of Christ have two areas of judgment. Certainly it's in keeping with what he would teach in the letter. There is an earthly government that we see in Romans chapter 13 that judges the infractions of all who make up that society. Paul's not talking about one of those situations. He says that those outside the body of Christ are ultimately going to be judged as all of us are by God. And so God will judge, he says, outsiders. He says, but here is a circumstance. When one is called a brother of Christ among you who is caught up in willful sin, God is calling on us to judge. Perhaps the dirtiest word in society, but here's what that word means here. God is establishing a pattern. He says that you are to consider the situation and the circumstance, and then you are to draw a proper conclusion. That is simply what is meant by judging. God gives us the criteria. He gives us the circumstances. He even gives us examples of those lifestyles of sin there at the end of this chapter to help us to know what kinds of things that He has in mind. And so as we walk back through that and see it, we see that we've got to keep a proper perspective about sin. No matter what our world says about it, the body of Christ must be true to its head. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is going to call the church the body of Christ, and we cannot walk contrary or in rebellion against His will. We can't harden our heart against what His Word has to say. 
But we also see that we are to try to preserve a soul for the judgment. This, as has already been stated, is an act of love. It's a last line of defense to plead with the heart of one who is overtaken in a trespass. But it's also to prevent the leavening, that is, the spreading of willful sin because of a congregation that says, you know, really we're just going to turn to blind eye. It's to purify our associations, not in some pharisaical, legalistic way in which anybody says to anyone else that we're better than you. That violates the spirit and the teaching of Galatians 6 and verse 1. And we are to practice judgment, a delegated judgment that our Lord has called on us. We're honored but also obligated to obey. You know, it seems to me that we all are pretty much reliant on GPS. I moved here from Denver and before that Richmond, big cities. And, you know, GPS wasn't as big in those, some of those days. And so I had to kind of hunt and peck through uh, getting it right and getting it wrong. I had to kind of find my way around town, maybe learn some of the secrets. But GPS came along. Before I got to Bowling Green, and it has ruined me in the smaller of the three places that I've lived because I just plug in the address, and I never have to think about where it is in relationship to other places. You think about the GPS. The GPS is put together by no, those who know the subject. The GPS is meant to give boundaries and borders and to show what's possible and impossible in travel, but it also is accommodated to the free will of the user. You can choose to ignore what it says or you can follow what it says. And the GPS has helped so many people to get to their final destination. Really, we could draw out several analogies, but I would suggest to you that God's Word is the ultimate GPS for our spiritual travel. In it, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father except through me. Those who have studied our subject this morning tell us that there is six times more said on the subject of church discipline than is said about the Lord's Supper. And yet so often, and I realize that this is the case, that so many congregations give so many reasons why they are choosing to ignore what God's Word so clearly says. I understand that when it comes to something this grave, this life-altering, that it can be done either with poor judgment or it can be done with great wisdom. Galatians 6 and verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. I came across a poem I think that is very fitting as we close. Think gently of the erring. You know not of the power with which the dark temptation came in some unguarded hour. You may not know how earnestly they struggled or how well until the hour of dark weakness came and sadly thus they fell. Think gently of the erring. Oh, do not now forget. However darkly stained by sin, he is your brother yet. Heir of the selfsame heritage, child of the self-same God. He has but stumbled in the path that you in weakness tried. Speak gently to the erring. You yet may lead them back with holy words and tones of love from misery's thorny track. Forget not you have sometimes sinned and sinful yet may be. Deal gently with the erring then as God has dealt with thee. If ever and whenever, church discipline has to be practiced. It must be done with the right attitude. And yet, beloved, it must be done. If someone has forsaken the Lord or has returned to the, the world, we have reasons given to us for why it must be done. Our elders are duty-bound to lead us in this. And we're duty-bound to follow them. I hope you see that at the heart of this is fellowship. 
Fellowship is so precious. The fellowship that God wants to have with all of us is predicated upon a hill called Calvary in which Jesus gave everything so that we could have that forever with Him. He has invited into us into fellowship because the sacrifice was made for us that responding to His grace and obedient faith, repentance and baptism, we can have that relationship with Him and be a part of His family. Oh, how wonderful it is not only to be a part of God's family, but God's family here. But you know, God makes a provision for us if as a child of God we fall away, if we're overtaken by sin. A loving Father waits and longs to forgive us and restore us. And He calls upon us when we have a brother or sister who is no longer in the fold for us to go and to retrieve them and to bring them back because of how much He loves them. This morning it may be that you find yourself in a circumstance where you're overtaken in the trespass of what we have considered today. Maybe you need to make things right. Or maybe you're just struggling with life. And you need us as your family to throw our arms around you, to encourage you, to pray with you. If you need to respond to this lesson, to the invitation of Christ, come right now as we stand and sing.